We'll be using Fusion 360 for parametric design, so I'd like to try to define some of what that means. I'm going to do it in the context of a live walkthrough of some parts, kind of explaining the core vocabulary and concepts as we go. So I'm looking here at the Dr. Zeglin team, looking at the CKS Course Resources project, and you don't need to follow along. This is more about uh, the ideas than the specific sort of details of this particular model. But let's dive into the laser cut components and open up the mounting plate for microservo. So this is a Fusion 360 design. It has several different components. Components correspond to parts. Um, and just to see that, there's a kind of core mounting plate, there's a servo part that's been inserted, and there's a couple of screws. So let's look down at the design history here, uh, the timeline at the bottom, and that'll help us to explore what we mean by parametric design. I'm gonna go ahead and wind this all the way back to this point in time. So what we see here is that the, the geometry of this mounting plate is actually defined by several different stages of calculation. There was an imported body that is some underlying, underlying uh, shape there. Um, and then on top of that was added a set of holes. And this is the key idea for parametric design is that rather than store one representation of the final form of an object, the object is defined by a series of operations that applied in the sequence can recompute the object. And the benefit of this is that one can go back and edit that sequence or edit individual parameters of that sequence and recalculate the part. And this is a way to either provide a part that can have variations to have different kind of duplicates or copies that have different properties. But more importantly, it's a way simply to iterate a design. As the idea for the design evolves, parameters change, uh, shapes will be evolved, and a well-constructed model enables you to easily update it and modify it as your ideas change. So the first thing to just note here is this is rigid body modeling. It's very hard to model flexible structures or uh, like fabric and even things like uh, rubber belts tend to be modeled in one orientation. It's not about the physics of the object, it's just about the geometry and it models it as rigid structures. So the core ideas here come from what's called constructive solid geometry. And that is about sort of defining a vocabulary of volumes and actions in those volumes. So let's look at a sort of specific example here. If I look now back in the, at the plate here, um, there's what's called a sketch. And the sketches are a basic building block for constructing all sorts of, of operations on our geometries. And the sketches, we're going to only use 2D sketches. So it's a set of just lines and circles and other features in a plane, just like a sketch on a paper. Only it happens to be uh, defined along some, any sort of reference plane in the model, including faces of parts or arbitrary coordinate systems. So what we see in the sketch here, and if I turn off the body for just a second, you'll see the sketch itself even more clearly. The sketch is a set of circles and lines. The dashed lines are construction, the solid lines have some specific geometric meaning. So the first thing to note is that um, uh, there are numbers. There's the definitions right here within the model. So for example, I can see there's a circle here that will be used as part of a cut operation to define a hole. If I simply go and change that number, it was, it was a quarter of an inch. Uh, if I change that to eight millimeters, all the holes get a little bigger. And if I finish my sketch and uh, recalculate that feature in the part, I have to turn the body back on, we'll see the holes are now a little bit larger. I'm gonna close the data panel just to get a little better screen space here. So clearly the model is manipulable. And if I go back into that sketch, I can, I can undo my change here. I could have done it in different ways. And so not only the parameterization of the, of the part can be changed, but I can add features at the stage and they will still, they'll propagate forward through the model. The other sort of major, major idea here is captured by these smaller symbols. You notice that there's um, around this dashed line are these little symbols that represent a symmetry operation. And this is a really key sort of idea in parametric design is that a well-constructed model captures what's called design intent. By, by drawing these circles as I have around a center line with the symmetry operator uh, constraining those circles to always be symmetric to that line, I captured some sense I have that this part is going to be a symmetric part. The left and right sides will have some relationship and then when given that in mind, when I now say there's a center line distance between two holes, here I say 25 millimeters between these holes. If I change that number, the holes will change their distance but stay symmetric around that line. 
And that's true because I've defined them with respect to a center line using a, uh, a symmetry constraint to keep them symmetric around that center line. There are many ways those holes could have been drawn. I could have referenced them to a corner, to edges, just drawn them as circles and dimensioned them to some other nearby point. Each of these would have captured a different understanding of what the part is intended to do. The idea that I'm specifying that these, these, that these holes are a given distance apart is, a, is an idea that these holes are going to line up with some other set of holes that are 25 mil millimeters apart. The idea that these holes are symmetric around the center line is capturing an idea that the part itself should remain symmetric even under changes. So this is the sort of essence of trying to program geometry by capturing your design intent, not only in the dimensions of the features, but also in the constraints that you apply to represent their relationships. So when actually drawing parts, which I won't do now, I'm going to do that separately. When you're actually drawing parts, part of the process is, as you go, deciding what are the salient relationships and trying to capture those in the constraints. That allows your design intent to be captured in the model, and that will make then future changes easier. A lot of times, really, the problem is you're designing, you're drawing the part not only to see it now, but also to allow yourself to change it in the future. And honestly, that takes a lot of experience. It takes a lot of practice and understanding how the overall design workflow tends to evolve to have a good sense of what kind of constraints you apply at the early stages to allow you flexibility at the later stages. And that's a hard thing to teach except by doing a lot of projects. The other sort of element here that's, uh, okay, so that's sort of the key, key ideas of parametric design. Um, design intent, a design history, their features, operations, and there's some idea of constraints. Let's now walk through some more of this particular design history and just see what kinds of operations were used. This won't reveal everything about the process, but it'll, it'll point out a few more features. The next stage here was there was a tab added. The tab at the bottom is intended to, to uh, be press fit into a square uh, slot on another laser cut part. Um, after that was a couple operations that resulted in an external component being in, uh, placed in the model. Um, this is a sort of complicated point that we'll come back to several times, but it is possible to have uh, components which are not defined within the single design, but are brought in from outside. And it's especially useful for some of the reference parts from the course kit as a way to bring them into the model. And there's a little link icon in this particular component that indicates the source geometry is coming from a separate design. And if that design changes, it'll also update in this design. That link can be broken to make it a purely local part, a purely local component. Um, but sometimes it's advantageous not to, just to let the source part define the geometry. The next thing that happens here is a, a brief comment on the idea of the joint. We'll see there's several different ways to produce parts that relate to each other in Fusion 360. And there's uh, one of these ways is what's called a joint. It can be a kinematic joint. It can actually allow freedoms, like a sliding joint or a pivoting joint. But many times, joints are simply used to fix two parts together rigidly. And as a, it has, it's a means for creating a relationship between parts. Um, that, has its, uh, that has its sort of gotchas, and we'll come back again and again to sort of best strategies for creating joints. But in this case, it's important to know that the joint between the servo and the plate is a rigid joint. It's just there to locate the two and keep them from moving around. Um, and then lastly, uh, there's sort of a comp set of uh, the, the, the the screws were imported separately um, as McMaster car parts from the catalog and then uh, placed in space and again just rigidly joined in location. Um, suffice it to say that the sort of idea of the parametric modeling extends to assemblies with the idea of associativity. Ideally, when one inserts a part, one has a way to define its position with respect to other parts such that when the parts change, the design remains associative in the sense that the, the sort of subsequent operations uh, automatically and correctly update to whatever new position makes sense. This can be a little tricky uh, when parts are just positioned in space and then rigidly defined. Sometimes they're defined more to a coordinate location than to a specific part of the geometry. But the idea is the same fluidity of creating relationships between features can extend not only to sort of extrusions and cuts within a single part, but to relationships between parts and assemblies. And if done well, then update, making one design change 
can have a ripple effect where the entire assembly correctly updates to reflect that change. This takes some practice, and we'll talk about this in a number of different ways. That's enough, for, I think, for this video. We're going to come back to uh, um, more specific design process in another.